Good evening, everyone. My name is John Paul Jones. I'm the Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and it's uh, a great pleasure to welcome everyone here tonight for the Howry Conversation on Nuclear War. And uh, featuring uh, here tonight, of course, a senior fellow for the um, uh, Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, Daniel Ellsberg, uh, of The Intercept, Editor-in-Chief, Betsy Reed, and Noam Chomsky, Laureate Professor of Linguistics and Agnes Snellms Howry uh, Chair at the University of Arizona. Thank you all for joining us. This January, my colleagues in geography hosted a talk by distinguished climate scientist Alan Roebuck of Rutgers University. He's one of the leading scientists and strongest voices for uh, nuclear disarmament. And he and his colleagues have demonstrated that even a ni limited nuclear war would, uh, ex uh, would uh, abruptly change the climate and starve billions of people in nuclear winter. And yet, everyone in this room has lived their entire life under the threat of nuclear war, their entire adult life. <laughs> We're not all activists, so how did we manage the psychic stress of living in the nuclear age? Through work, perhaps, or social or familial diversions, or perhaps resignation or complacency. Or perhaps we came to trust that our political and military leaders have built and maintained well-designed institutional and technological safeguards against catastrophe. If that's your answer, then you haven't read Daniel Ellsberg's new book, <laughs> The Doomsday Machine. It is a harrowing first-person look into the manifold contingencies of nuclear war planning. We might be lucky, but we are not secure. So when Valeria Chomsky offered to facilitate Daniel Ellsberg's visit to Tucson to talk with Noam, I was delighted, and I'm very grateful. Thank you, Valeria. And now a few other thanks. First, to the uh, outstanding professionals from the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences in tech and development and outreach and marketing and communication. To our long-term partners, Arizona Public Media. And to Peggy Johnson in the Loft Cinema, where Daniel Ellsberg will appear for a special event tomorrow evening. <laughs> and fourth, uh, to Michael Bloom, an SBS alum, and CEO of First Look Media, the parent organization of The Intercept. Michael took an interest in this project and shared with us the talented author and journalist Betsy Reed, who will moderate tonight's discussion. The Intercept is live streaming tonight's conversation to a worldwide audience. Not last, I want to thank the Agnes Nelms Howery Program in Environment and Social Justice for, for first supporting Nome. Uh, position here at the University of Arizona, and second, for sponsoring tonight's Howry conversation. Mrs. Howry's work on behalf of international peace lives on through tonight's event. And now I'd like to invite former dean of the UA College of Law, Regents Professor, and chair of the Howry Program Advisory Council, Tony Massaro, to introduce tonight's panel. This program is entirely consonant with the future that we want to leave to the next generations, and that's a big thing that the Hari program is about. How to find the courage and the creativity and the political will to make a better world for those who come after us. With special attention to how academic institutions and community actors can link arms in authentic partnerships. This is the land grant mission writ large. And today's topic strikes deep into our concern about the future, the possibility of not having one. Tonight's program also is consonant with the spirit of Mrs. Hari. She had a keen intellect. She believed in questioning conventional knowledge. And she was committed to free and open debate of important matters of public concern. 
Mrs. Hari would have been right in front, leaning forward with her piercing blue eyes, and afterwards she would gently but firmly buttonhole every member of this panel at the close of the talk and ask important questions. Tonight you have, all of you, the unique privilege of hearing three people engage about the threats of nuclear war, given the global advances in the creation and possession of this doomsday machine. First we have our own, feels very good to say that, Professor Noam Chomsky. Dr. Chomsky is considered the father of modern linguistics. He's a towering figure in analytical philosophy and one of the founders of the field of cognitive science. I love this story, I can't resist, at age 10. He writes his first article, the topic, the spread of fascism following the fall of Barcelona to Francisco Franco's forces. <laughs> this is exactly what all 10-year-olds are thinking about. One of his earliest memories consisted of watching security officers beat women strikers outside of a textile plant. The memory of injustice and the apprehension of fascism shaped him forever thereafter. And this all was wedded with an uncommon intellect and the ability to see things anew. As he once described what true science is, it's the willingness to be puzzled by simple things. He has that spark which has enabled him to forge new fields and to speak out eloquently on many topics of urgent concern. He received his PhD from Penn. He then was recruited to MIT. His first book opposed the dominant approach to the study of linguistics and has been described as a revolution. In 1959, he published a critique of verbal behavior and challenged the author's entire view of language, which cemented his academic reputation as one of the most creative, path-breaking, and intellectually daring people in his field. Also one of the most prolific. I'm pretty sure he's a hologram. He's authored over 100 works since, and he remains amazingly productive. But of course, Dr. Chomsky did not stay in his academic linguistics lane. Oh no, he was an outspoken anti-Vietnam War, uh, war activist. He wrote multiple pieces on the abuses of the US military overseas, and he participated in many protests, some of which ended with his arrest. He wrote Manufacturing Consent, a really powerful critique of government propaganda. He spoke up early and often and still. Not everybody loved what he had to say. He was named to President Richard M. Nixon's enemies list. You can see that this deterred him. He continued to publicly and vigorously oppose military interventions from the Reagan administration's interventions in South America to the war on terrorism. But he also maintained the apprehension first expressed at age 10 about fascism. And in particular, he objects to the way in which repressive regimes, right and left, suppress discourse. He's a passionate defender of free speech. Even those, he would go so far as to defend the right of a Holocaust denier to espouse anti-factual views. For all of this, he's earned countless honors and accolades, which he calls absurd. <laughs> but his name is an indispensable and enduringly significant adjective in the field of linguistics. To be Chomskyan is to signal something, a distinctive approach to language and thought. Almost no intellectuals leave such a deep and distinctive mark on their fields. So there are many honors for the work, but here I can't resist with a wink and a nod to our own red and blue and beloved Sonoran Desert. Some have been heard to say that his greatest achievement is joining us. <laughs> Others would say, not really, there's a species of bees named for Mr. Chomsky. That's pretty cool also. Suffice it to say, we're very happy that he's here among us and that you thought of this program for us tonight, Mrs. Chomsky, thank you so much. And now his friend and co-conspirator, Daniel Ellsberg, former consultant to the Department of Defense and the White House, responsible, as everyone knows, for the release of the Pentagon Papers. <laughs> Senior fellow of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, he earned his degree in economics from Harvard and then attended Cambridge for a year studying on a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship. And he went back to Harvard to complete his graduate studies. In 1954, he enlisted in the Marines. Mr. Ellsberg was discharged in 1957 as a first lieutenant and went back to Harvard as a junior fellow for two years. His PhD dissertation was rooted in decision theory, which is a branch of economics related to game theory. His work gave rise to what's now known as the Ellsberg Paradox, 
basically, people prefer the devil they know and will take a known risk with low chances of winning over an unknown risk that could guarantee a win. And the paradox has given rights to a large body of scholarship. Another intellectual who became an adjective. <laughs> he worked in the, in, in the Pentagon and then overseas in Vietnam. And on his return, he contributed to the top secret study that became, uh, uh, with respect to the conduct of the Vietnam War, that became known as the Pentagon Papers. He grew dis increasingly disillusioned with the war. And he says that upon meeting a draft resistor named Randy Keller, he had a life-changing reaction. Quote, it wasn't what he said that changed my worldview. It was the example he was setting with his life. How his words in general showed he was a stellar American and he was going to jail as a very deliberate choice. And there was no, thought, no question in my mind that our government was involved in an unjust war that was gonna continue and get larger. Thousands of men were dying each year and I left the auditorium and found a deserted men's room and wept for over an hour. That's the only time in my life I've reacted to anything like that. He began producing copies of the Pentagon Papers thereafter, and you know the rest of the story. In 1971, the New York Times published the first of nine excerpts. He was charged with violation of the Espionage Act, but all charges eventually dismissed. You know, too, that the publication of the papers sparked a furor that helped to contribute to the end of the war and the dim diminishing support for it. It also resulted in, as a teacher of the First Amendment, I'm, I'm very proud to meet you and say, a canonical case by the United States Supreme Court that to this day protects freedom of the press. His latest book is Doomsday Machine. I commend it to you. Um, these are his words, sober, bipartisan, messages about the American presidency. If you can't handle the thought that the president lies to the public for all kinds of reasons, you couldn't stay at government at that level, or you're made aware of it one week. The fact is presidents rarely say the whole truth. Essentially, they never say the whole truth of what they expect and what they're doing and what they believe. This historic conversation, we're extremely lucky tonight, is going to be monitored, uh, moderated. Um, you try to monitor them. <laughs> Good luck with that, uh, by Ms. Betsy Reed, Editor-in-Chief of The Intercept. This is an online news source dedicated to what it calls adversarial journalism. Here's what she believes. She believes in transparency in government institutions. In her eyes, her role as a journalist is to create a shift. Government and corporations, she's written, have a penetrating gaze on all of us, and they're gathering all this information, and they're allowed privacy and secrecy. So she believes her job is to turn that around and apply some transparency to them. She's written several books, editorial contributions to Blackwater and Dirty Wars. Uh, she's talked about, written about the private military industry, the Obama administration use of drones. She's been editor for the essay collection Going Rogue, Sarah Palin, An American Nightmare, which examined the effect of Palin's vice presidential run on politics. She also worked at The Nation, which has a long uh, and storied history of progressive politics. But Ms. Reed believes that the magazine was preaching to the choir. So she made the jump to the intercept because that's not associated with particular political leaning or silos. She believes that the intercept is a way to make a difference, to reach a wider audience like the one tonight. Please join me in welcoming three people who share a passion for discovery and communication of matters of urgent public concern. People who are human adjectives and agitators who seek disclosure of things that have been both intentionally buried and that hides in plain view before our eyes, often clouded by partisan cataracts. Can everybody hear us? Yes. So I'm uh, delighted to be here uh, with the father of modern whistleblowing and, um, and Professor Chomsky. Um, and I think it's um, it, the first time the two of you have sat on a public stage together, even though you've had a dialogue for some 40 years as, as friends and co-conspirators. Um, and w one thing that I think is extraordinary is that um, you, Dan, really sat in the belly of the beast and, 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 and you, Professor Chomsky, are the foremost critic of that beast of American empire. So um, we're just thrilled to be able to see you in, in dialogue in public for the first time tonight. Um, so I want to start with um, Dan Ellsberg. Um, 
relating to your book, the the um, the Doomsday Machine, um, it, the Pentagon Papers is you know, your most fa famous contribution um, to American history. But at the same time that you were collecting the thousands of documents um, that were then leaked about the Vietnam War, uh, you were also collecting thousands of other documents, right, which you've written about now for the first time. Can you tell us the story what, of what those documents mean? Why did it take almost 50 years to get them out? And um, are they still relevant to the, the, the world today? Mm -hmm. Well, that, that very uh, good introduction here of all of us in, in mentioning my book, she mentioned the name of the title, The Doomsday Machine, but didn't give the subtitle, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. And when I chose that title, it really was more rhetorical in a way. You know, I thought attention getting and so forth. But in the course of writing, finishing it, and rereading a lot of my old work uh, and so forth, I realized there was more to confess than I had started out by thinking. It was a more serious confession, as is in the book. In fact, <clears throat> people used to think that I had given the Pentagon Papers out of guilt, and I would always say, no, my feeling was not guilt. It was one of responsibility. I was trying to help end a war, and uh, I felt that I'd participated in it. Uh, and that gave me a special responsibility uh, once I realized how wrong it was and how hopeless and wrongful it was to try to end it. And so it, it wasn't something that I felt particularly guilty about. And my wife used to say, Patricia, you know, and she'd hear me, Dan, you should feel more guilty than you do. <laughs> <laughs> as, I, as I think Noam would <laughs> probably agree. <laughs> but um, in fact, soon after I started copying, uh, for which I expected to be charged uh, with counts that would send me to prison for life. And in fact, it was 12 felony counts for a possible 115 years in prison. But having started that, uh, I realized it was really more important, uh, it seemed to me, to inform the world about nuclear uh, matters, the dangers of the nuclear era. And <clears throat> I had in my safe thousands of pages of uh, notes and estimates and files that I had written over the years that I worked on nuclear war planning. In, uh, I had been a specialist in the command and control of nuclear weapons, starting in the Pacific and then elsewhere, uh, the possibilities of unauthorized action and uh, possibly the effects of accident, things like that. And that got me into looking at the war plans. I probably read more war plans in the, in the Pacific Command than any civilian had been given access to, as far as I ever knew. And as a result, I was uh, in, once the Kennedy administration was in, I was given the task of rewriting the Eisenhower guidance for the war plans that had prevailed through the 50s and into early 61. And what I wrote eventually became Secretary of Defense McNamara's guidance to the Joint Chiefs of Staff for the annual operational war plan uh, for general war, for general nuclear war. And uh, that's what a lot of this book is about. I had a lot of notes on that and so forth, and I really copied everything in my top secret safe. That was something that I didn't tell anyone until this book came out, really, except my one main lawyer, not the other lawyers, and not my wife, actually, at the time. I didn't want to implicate her in it, or my co-defendant, Tony Russo. And, uh, or even the other lawyers. So none of them knew that I had done this. And really, uh, I, I missed some of what was said here in the introduction because it is my left ear and I <laughs> didn't, didn't get all that. But uh, I don't know if she mentioned, I heard her talking, yes, about when I went in the men's room and wept, about Randy Keeler. I don't know if she used the name, did she? No. Uh, who was a young man who was on the way to prison uh, for draft resistance actually for simply telling his draft board that he would not no longer cooperate with giving his address, change of address, to the draft board. That's all it took to go to prison for a 20-year-old or a 19-year-old in those days. And as she said, I was thunderstruck by this. Uh, I had just gotten an impression of him as of an exemplary young American. There were, was at a conference of the War Resisters International with people from all over the world and I had been thinking, I'm glad they get to see a, a chance in the Vietnam War, that they get a chance to see 
an American like this. And as I was thinking those thoughts, I was hearing him saying that he was going to join his other colleagues from the men from the War Resisters League office in San Francisco in prison. Uh, there would be only women left. The others were in prison, and he said, I'm, I'm happy that I'm about to be joining him then. And I hadn't known that that was in prospect, and I was totally struck by it. And as she said, I went to a men's room. I cried for a long time at what my country had come to. In fact, there's a there's a Leonard Cohen song, uh, dress rehearsal rag, actually, about a guy who's about to commit suicide. But the chorus of it is of his poem is, so it's come to this, it's come to this, and wasn't it a long way down? And wasn't it a strange way down? And I thought, this is my country now where my 13-year-old son is bound for prison because that's the best thing that these young men can do against the war. And I suspect he will do it too. And actually, the war was still on five years later when he became 18. And he did turn in his draft card. But uh, I, I cried, as I said, at the thought of where my country was. And then when I got up from that, I thought, OK, now what can I do to help shorten the war now that I'm ready to go to prison? And uh, it actually, copying the Pentagon Papers were not the first thing I thought of doing because they were history. They ended in 1968. It's now 1969, a new president, a new Nixon, he claims, during the campaign. He was going to end the war. It wasn't clear that this history would really do very much. And I tried other things to get Democrats to do, which they were not willing to do. That's another story, not for tonight. But. Uh, in the end, uh, I felt, OK, this is a history of 7,000 pages of lies and crimes and broken treaties and deception of the public, aggression, essentially. And maybe it will help to get it out. Well, that's, as I say, a story I don't want to go into tonight because we have a, a new subject of the nuclear war. But having started that, I then decided, OK, uh, I'll, I'll copy all the top contents of my top secret safe. and. Um, and put that out. But what I was leading up to was that I did see Randy Keeler in San Francisco on his way to prison, basically. He, was, he went there a little after. And I told him what I was going to do. Uh, he was the only person I can think of. I told that. Uh, not Tony Russo, my, helped me copy, by the way. My, as I say, later, my, my chief lawyer. But I wanted him to know that he'd had an effect on me you know, and that to know that when he went to prison, it had not been without effect. And I had, uh, he was a model for me. So he said, forget the, Pen the Vietnam Papers. They weren't called the Pentagon Papers yet. We know enough about Vietnam, as, as Noam was saying to me this afternoon. You know, it didn't reveal all that much that was not known to, to critics of the war. What it revealed was that what the critics were saying was well known to insiders. And they, they understood it, but they were going, they were going on despite that, in consciousness of it, but despite it. So that was the secret in a way. But as Randy said, the nuclear papers are much more important. Put those out. Forget the Vietnam study. And my answer was, I agree with you. Uh, the nuclear papers are more important. But Vietnam is where the bombs are falling right now. And I've got to do what I can to try to shorten that. And when they have. When that has run their course, uh, I, I didn't know it, it, that in effect meant after my first trial or during my first trial. Then I'll put out the nuclear papers. And I knew that would put me in prison forever, for sure. Well, as you mentioned, uh, I gave, or implied, I gave them to my brother uh, separately for safekeeping. And he briefly, it's in the book, um, put them in a wooden box inside a green garbage bag and buried them in the town dump in Terrytown, in a, in a bluff um, over a road. And with a green stove on top of it, it happened to be there. Uh, he couldn't move, but it was there. And that would mark where he buried the documents. So fine. So um, during the, that very summer when I was on trial, uh, indicted by that time, he informed me that Tropical Storm Doria uh, hurricane had hit New York, 
and had moved the stove a hundred <laughs> yards. And the, uh, the bluff had gone down over the, uh, over the side of the road, and they were searching for it, though. But I was, I was sure that with his searching, he would, he would find these. And I didn't worry too much about it, because he was working every weekend to find it. Uh, he had someone, actually, who used a dousing rod in part uh, on weekends. And they got a backhoe at one point to shovel up the uh, contents of the dump and found a lot of garbage bags, but not one with top secret documents inside. <laughs> so eventually, it became clear by the end of my trail, they were gone. And the answer to your, tri uh, to your question is, when the war ended, I did summarize really the first third of this book, uh, you know, the, the story about my, uh, what I'd found from the war plans and the dangers, uh, and was told by a publisher with, about nuclear and without documents, she said, this will sell 1,400 copies. So I said, well, that's one for every member of Congress. And, um, <laughs> journalists and some academics, so okay, fine. She said, no, that means we won't publish it. And that was basically true for, for really the last 40 years now, pretty much. Uh, I've done various things uh, uh, in the course of arrests for civil disobedience. I've testified under oath to the, a lot of the contents that was in that book, actually, in hope that doing it under oath would get a little attention for some of the things we'll talk about tonight, but it didn't. And uh, I think that the lack of documents was, was critical to that. But this very book was turned down by 17 publishers uh, a few years ago, and Bloomsbury finally took it up. So this was not a subject that, that readers were anxious to, you know, that this would not make the book fly off the shelves. But you were able to um, obtain the documents that were lost through... Yes, well, now, when you say over time... Uh, actually, a lot of the documents have become declassified now with right. Freedom of Information Act suits and the uh, uh, National Security Archive of uh, George Washington University has gotten a lot of these out, including some of the most sensitive stuff, but not, not everything that I had. And uh, so that helps at least establish that you know, what I'm telling is uh, in basis. I, w I was afraid that people would, would uh, challenge this in reviews. You know, what does he know? It's 50 years ago and um, things have all changed. And no one has said that, because all the evidence is from insiders as well, it hasn't changed. That nothing essentially has changed. So uh, uh, the risks are there. In fact, the, the response of those who have read it is pretty good. I wanted to ask Professor Chomsky, I mean, you have written extensively about the period that is covered in um, Dan Elford's book, um, did you learn anything from it? Did you find anything new? Oh, definitely. Uh, I agree with uh, Randy Keller that uh, this book, I think, which is essential reading, I do strongly recommend that you read it, is actually more important than the release of the Pentagon Papers. That was a major contribution, but this, I think, uh, goes even beyond. And uh, the topics that are in the book are uh, issues that I've been studying, uh, working on for 70 years. I thought I knew a lot about it, but I did learn from the book. And things that I learned were hair-raising. Uh, so, for example, I, uh, I learned and did not know that during the Eisenhower period, and this basically carried on, there was one war plan. And the war plan was that if there was a confrontation with the Russians in Berlin, whatever, maybe a small confrontation, then immediately we wipe out every city in China. I mean, the enormity of that idea takes a while to sink in. There was no alternative plan. That was the plan then tried to develop alternative plans, but something like that remains. Uh, another uh, discovery, uh, other things kind of confirm surmises that I couldn't really establish, but I, I had the sense all through the 40s, 50s, 60s, and on that the 
scale of the alleged Russian threat was being greatly exaggerated. And it turns out from what Dan released that the uh, estimates of Russian ground forces were wildly exaggerated. Uh, the bomber gap didn't exist. The missile gap did exist, but as Dan published, it was in our favor. Uh, and uh, the uh, huge buildup of armaments on the U.S. side and the uh, fear-mongering and uh, uh, population control that was involved was based on, can't say fraud, because people actually believed it, but on gross misestimates, which themselves, I think, can only be explained by uh, ideological uh, commitments that f compelled interpretation of data in an extremely negative fashion. Uh, some, of, some of this you could figure out just by reading the documents, but the, uh, the confirmation from the inside is extremely important. And that led to another uh, revelation in the book that I found extremely shocking. Uh, it the, turns out that uh, after the uh, fraud, the falsity, you, you'll recall the missile gap. The, when Kennedy was elected, it was, uh, he was claiming that, uh, in fact, the, uh, and the Air Force actually and Rand agreed that uh, there was the, the Russians were way ahead of us in missiles and weapons and could wipe us out at no time and so on. It was exposed. And Dan was instrumental in exposing it. And after it was exposed, uh, as he points out in the book, policies continued with no change. It turned out that we were far ahead of the Russians in uh, armaments, in technology. They, they had literally no deterrent. But the policies of the, that were based on assuming massive Russian uh, overwhelming force ready to, and an intent to conquer the world after that was all exposed as untrue, the programs remained. We continued to follow exactly the same programs, and that continues until today. Uh, this is a, an example, which I hadn't known, of something that you do find, I think, when you look through the record carefully, uh, there's almost, uh, we're, we're told all the time that uh, everything has to be done in the name of security. But what you find is that security, at least security of the population, uh, just is not a concern. It's so low on the ranking that you can't even find it in the record. Uh, and this is another con striking confirmation of that. Uh, there are other examples. Uh, another revelation, which is almost unpronounceable, can't find words for it, uh, Dan discovered he, uh, he, he, demand, he requested answers to certain questions which had never apparently been asked, uh, such as in the one war, general war plan that exists, how many people do you expect to be killed when it's carried out? Turns out maybe a billion, you know, if you think it through. Uh, how can, as he says in the book, how can even, how can people even dream of having a war plan like this? And it could, a war could be set off just by inadvertence. There's case after case, many are discussed in the book, where we came extremely close to war just by inadvertence sometimes reckless actions on the part of leaders, but sometimes just uh, accidents that happen. So one example that I didn't know that comes out in the book is what, that when the uh, first early warning system was established to uh, uh, detect incoming missiles, which would have been 1958, I guess. Oh, uh, 1960. 60, yeah. Turns out in this new sophisticated system to detect incoming missiles in the first week of operation first day when it was first turned day off. of operation it turned it off first yeah. day of operation it detected a, R a russian missile attack with 99.9 percent .9 certainty first day of operation 
Unfortunately, nobody paid attention. But, uh, <laughs> but that kind of thing happens over and over, and the war plans are set up so that if somebody acts on that 99%, a billion people die. I mean, this is what we've been living with for 70 years and are continuing to live with today. And bear in mind that the Bulletin of Atomic Science is the doomsday clock that they established in 1947, shortly after the first the uh, atom bombing in, in Japan. Uh, the doomsday clock, as I'm sure most of you know, sets the minute hand a certain distance from midnight. Midnight means terminal disaster for the species. Uh, at the beginning, 47, it was set at seven minutes to midnight. It's kind of oscillated up and back uh, since then. The closest it came to midnight was in 1953, when the United States and then the Soviet Union exploded thermonuclear weapons. And one of the things I learned from the book is that the uh, there was an expectation on the part of U.S. scientists, probably Russian scientists, that the thermonuclear weapons might set the whole atmosphere on fire and destroy everything. They thought it was a pretty low probability, but not zero. And it turns out some of the estimates that Dan reviews in the book are hair-raising. But and in fact, they, mis they miscalculated the uh, uh, impact by a factor of three, I think it was. And... Uh, but, and then the minute hand went to two minutes to midnight. It's never gotten that close again until last January when it was moving, when uh, President Trump was inaugurated. It went to two and a half minutes to midnight. Last January went to two minutes to midnight. Uh, I think if uh, they had had a chance to look at uh, the nuclear posture review, which came out a couple months later, they might move it forward. I don't know what you think about that. But this is what we've been living with. And the uh, page after page of the book contains graphic uh, examples of this kind of, you can only call it insanity. And in fact, Dan at one point describes the book as a chronicle of human madness, which I think captures the uh, character of... Uh, the era that we've been living with uh, very accurately. And we should bear in mind that this is only one of two existential threats. The other, which has run in parallel, in fact, through the same years, uh, is uh, another dramatic illustration of human madness. Uh, the threat of global warming is extremely serious. It's not far off. Uh, right this generation is going to have to decide whether to deal with it seriously. And we have this astonishing phenomenon, amazing phenomenon of the most powerful country in world history, which is refusing to participate in global efforts to address the crisis. And worse than that, is dedicated to accelerating the crisis. It's really hard to find words even to describe this, but it's another testimony to human madness alongside what Dan records so fully and eloquently in Doomsday Machine. And at one point in the book, Dan mentions that this seems to be a species pathology, something about the species. And I think that's something to think about. It's very dramatic. In fact, if you look, there's a lot of information looking back into the history of the human species, which suggests that somehow there's a lethal streak in the species of extraordinary savagery, which is sometimes controlled, sometimes breaks out, and shows up in uh, what Dan rightly calls a chronicle of human madness. We, we received some questions um, from the audience um, ahead of 
uh, this event, and, and a lot of them centered on Trump for understandable reasons. There's a lot of fear um, that that was something that was talked about in the campaign, him, him having his finger on the button, the, the spectacle of the nuclear football. And of course, that is terrifying and combined with his um, foreign policy approach. But um, one thing you write about um, in your book is the, the phenomenon of the, the sub-delegation of authority um, to um, to actually initiate a nuclear strike. I thought maybe you could one, expand one, on go that. Ahead on that. Mm -hmm. Well, one okay. qualification to the idea of the finger on the button is another <laughs> revelation in the book, which is pretty shattering. Turns out it's not a finger on the button. It's lots of fingers on the right, button. Right, that's, that's yeah. yeah. Turns out that, uh, as Dan revealed, that Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, this is part of the his inquiries actually led to the discovery of this fact, the revelation of it, that uh, President Eisenhower had sub had delegated, sub-delegated authority to launch a nuclear war to the uh, main, the, the major uh, uh, figures, the admirals, and I suppose the head, the head of SAC, the main, the main admirals. They had the authority to launch a nuclear war. And the logic was compelling uh, if uh, the logic was that if Washington was suddenly destroyed in a, a nuclear attack, uh, somebody had to retaliate. So therefore, it was subdelegated. But as Dan points out, there was a problem in that logic. Now, the problem is that every one of the people to whom authority was subdelegated followed the same logic. Now, suppose I'm wiped out. I better have other people down there who are uh, have the authority to uh, launch a nuclear war. And it turns out when you look at the details that even bomber pilots, say during the, who were flying B-52s over half the world during the Cuban Missile Crisis, had the possibility of launching a nuclear war. And the chances are that none of that has changed. So it isn't really, a finger on the button is bad enough, but it's the reality is much worse. And of course, the idea that the person with the biggest finger is a <laughs> middle a finger, totally unpredictable yeah, finger. megalomaniac, <laughs> doesn't make well, anybody. Homie says they're average size fingers, so we'll, 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 uh, city. As a, remember, well, he has a bigger, bigger knows, finger than he noticed. The president's hands were not unusually small, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> big enough for the. For the but it says it's his button that's bigger. Remember what he said? Yeah. He said for Kim Jong Un, my button is bigger than yours. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And uh, we have an and I, I guess president. I don't know what you think. You presume that other nuclear powers have the same system. Is what? That other nuclear powers have the same oh, yeah. subdelegation yeah. and. I sub think no, no nuclear power probably, uh, certainly not the major ones. Certainly not Russia. Uh, allows themselves to be paralyzed by a single bomb on Moscow, let's say, or on Washington. So they've made arrangements. Uh, and uh, my guess is very strong that Kim Jong-un has not allowed it to be possible to paralyze their retaliatory power by an attack on him, either, which we rehearsed. Uh, in fact, that's one of the issues of the summit uh, that I hope will take place but to address the fact that we do rehearse invasion of North Korea every year and assassination of Kim Jong-un. And if that's in the belief that that would decapitate them, quote, uh, I think that's probably as false as it has always been for Russia or the U.S. Uh, they've always made arrangements that other people will have both authority and capability to uh, retaliate in that case. And by the way, Noam, when you, when you were saying, uh, you started to say that um, here we are with his second uh, existential problem of climate, but you start to say, and we're not even negotiating and or taking part in discussions. In fact, we're going in the wrong direction. I actually thought you were going to end the sentence differently uh, when I heard it. The fact that this last summer, 122 nations, you know, have signed, you know, in a, a treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons. Now, that is not likely to affect the behavior of the nine nuclear states very quickly, if at all, but very strikingly, and this is what I thought you were about to comment on, the U.S. refused to participate even in the discussion of this, 
and in fact used uh, every kind of muscle it had to keep other its other allies successfully from even participating in the discussion of eliminating nuclear weapons, which we are bound by Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, going back to 68 and 69, 19. We have a, a treaty commitment, you know, the supreme law, basically ratified by the Senate, that says we will take part in, we will negotiate in good faith for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, on the one hand, we are in no such negotiations whatever, you know, at this time. But second, there really has never been a day since 1968 when any American leader in good faith thought about eliminating nuclear weapons, with the possible exception of the, of the brief discussion between Gorbachev and Reagan, actually, at Reykjavik, where, uh, even, where I think Reagan was, amazingly enough, we didn't know from outside that he was abhorrent of nuclear war, nuclear weapons. He didn't sound that way, but uh, he was apparently. Uh, and he did have some discussion of eliminating the only one that's ever been held, to my knowledge, at, at almost any level. But what took priority in his mind was the, the bubble, uh, the idea that there would be a Star Wars, a strategic defense initiative, SDI, that would protect us from any nuclear weapons altogether. And he, he could not give up the idea of space-based tests, which would abrogate the anti-ballistic missile treaty. So he always had, like every other president, a higher priority than reducing the threat of the doomsday machine. And that's been true for all the presidents. So to get back to your question, Betsy, it, your original question, it, this didn't start with Trump. It has attracted people's attention, and that in itself is a good thing. You know, the, if, it, uh, if the world doesn't blow up as a result, people are thinking about it now because Trump has scared them, the way that Reagan scared them, of course, you know, uh, helped build, mobilize the freeze movement but uh, back in the 80s. But it didn't start with Trump and it won't end with Trump. As I say, no, every president has engaged in some discussion of possible imminent use of nuclear weapons, mostly in secret from the American public. And sometimes in public, like what you point out about Iran, that every candidate, with the acceptance, uh, exception of uh, Dennis Kucinich and Ron Paul, yeah, right. said with regard to right. Iran, One percent that of, all uh, options are open, meaning nuclear weapons uh, as an option. Incidentally, that's even those statements are in violation of international law. You take a look at the UN Charter, the foundation of modern international law. Uh, Article 2.4, four parts, says bans uh, the threat or use of force in international affairs. We're constantly, every president, every candidate, with those minor exceptions, has violated this by calling, by, by threatening the use of unlimited force, including nuclear weapons, in the case of Iran. And there's a lot to say about this particular case, but it's another example, if we look into the details, if there's time we could, of how the United States is basically alone in undermining a very constructive approach to whatever threat anybody thinks Iran might pose. We will not permit it. Now, this is a critical fact which ought to be very prominently discussed. I don't know if there's time to go into it. Huh? Yeah. Well, people ask whether, uh, and what worried them, is that we have a president that they think might use nuclear weapons, might actually use them. Well, they're missing the point. I, in fact, I haven't heard anyone say he is using them. He has used them. He's yes. using them in the way you, uh, that every president has, actually, not just Trump. But use it the way you use a gun when you point it at somebody's head in a confrontation, whether or not you pull the trigger. You're using the gun. In fact, that's a major person reason why people with guns have them who use them at 7-Elevens or wherever uh, mugging. Uh, they hope they'll get their way without having to pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. But uh, And we haven't pulled the trigger, but in a way, uh, coming to the, with the number of threats that have been made, many secret from the American public, not from the people who received the threats, as in the case of Vietnam under Nixon. Now, what Trump is doing 
is saying rather publicly, uh, unusually, actually, we haven't had uh, that he is threatening fire and fury. It's interpreted as nuclear weapons, or at least a conflict that will likely escalate by one side or the other to nuclear once it gets started. It's a conflict that must not get started, I would say, absolutely not under any conditions, because this is the first president since the Cuban Missile Crisis, 55 years ago, to make direct threats of armed conflict against a nuclear weapons state, a state that has nuclear weapons. Most of these other threats we've made against North Vietnam or uh, Iran earlier, as you were mentioning, and Korea and other, did not have nuclear weapons. Soviet Union did in uh, 1962 and later. But North Korea does have nuclear weapons. And uh, the smallest attack on North Korea is likely to lead to counteractions that would lead one side or the other to be using nuclear weapons. And that would mean a two-sided nuclear war for the first time in history. And it wouldn't be one that ends most life on Earth, like a war with Russia, because we don't have enough cities. Uh, or rather, uh, North Korea doesn't have enough cities to burn. We haven't talked about nuclear winter here particularly, but that's a major aspect of my book. And they don't have enough weapons to burn our cities to cause smoke that will cause mass famine. But it will be more violence than the world has ever seen in a day or a week or a month. Millions of people uh, dead. So it's of extreme importance that that not happen. But I'm just saying Trump in this instance is doing publicly what other presidents like Nixon did privately in 69, threatening, using the nuclear weapons to threaten. Yeah. Well, actually, Dan, in the book has a list of 25 cases where the threat of nuclear weapons has in fact been used in actual crises. And as he says, it's very much like uh, walking into a store with a loaded gun and uh, robbing the store when you're in fact using the gun even if you don't shoot it. Then this is constant. Furthermore, it's worth bearing in mind that this continues after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, so. Uh, in 1995, uh, the uh, Clinton administration came out with one of the most shocking documents I've ever read. That's the uh, uh, Strat Strategic Command, uh, which is in control of nuclear weapons, uh, published a document called Essentials of Col Post-Cold War Deterrence. And that should really be read. It's a public doc. It's ma been made public. Essentials of Post-Cold War Deterrence. Uh, what it says is that we must maintain uh, for the, the right of first strike, for first uh, strike meaning devastating use of nuclear weapons, and we must ma maintain our, our nuclear weapons system because it, nuclear weapons cast their shadow over any crisis, meaning as long as others know we have this and we might use it, that gives us an advantage in any crisis. And then it goes on to develop, the first time I've seen in an official document, what's known as the madman theory. It goes on to say that we must create a national persona of being irrational and vindictive and possibly out of control so that others will really be terrified of us. And we must uh, and th this is 1995. This is Clinton, not Trump. Uh, f further, and uh, it's after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, an indication of the of what Dan points out repeatedly in the book. It's an institutional problem. It's not particular individuals. It's a deep institutional problem. And when he mentions at one point a. Uh, species problem, I think that's something to think about, too. Uh, no, you, uh, no, it's good. You, you picked that up. I'm not sure I, I quoted that in the book. Uh, do you remember? I think not. Yeah. It was one I was telling them, this I was so depressed at how much I had to leave out of this book yeah. that I wanted to put in. And that's one of the examples. And it would have been very, uh, very pertinent now. Of course, when I wrote the book, I didn't have Trump in mind, actually. Yeah. But Trump is, you know, openly using this notion 
of unpredictability, impulsiveness, temper, whatnot, to make himself more look more dangerous to other people, uh, that is, uh, other adversaries. And it has been noted that that was the Nixon madman theory, which I talk about in the book, but which um, was not known at the time that he had that in mind. It, it was revealed by H.R. Haldeman later when Haldeman was in prison and published uh, his memoir for lawyer sees and whatnot and reveal this madman theory. Well, Nixon had gotten it, he said, from Eisenhower, essentially, in, in Korea. And uh, in other words, it's pervaded the thing. Something I'm not sure whether I, I said as clearly as I might have in the book, I, maybe or not, but it's this, that uh, our policy, especially in NATO, pointing nuclear first use directly at Russia, has always been a threat of an insane action yeah. that would destroy, even when the Russians didn't have many ICBMs against the US, we thought they did, but they didn't. They had hundreds of missiles pointed at Europe, uh, short range missiles, medium range missiles, bombers, everything. If we had carried out our commitment to NATO virtually from the very beginning, starts, you know, around 49, but uh, but the nuclear part of it doesn't get to be the core of it till the early 50s. By the early 50s, the core of our NATO commitment was and remains first use, if necessary, and it was assumed it would be necessary, against Russian conventional forces, which were thought to be overwhelming. Well, that was at a time when the Russians, by that time, already had the ability to annihilate West Europe with what they had. It was kind of a suicide pact, not at first for us, but for Europe. And uh, uh, in that sense, I say, it's, we've been relying on a madman theory from the entire NATO uh, up till the day. Uh, now West Germany, or Germany I should say, is no longer worried about invasion, but we've extended NATO to the Baltics, you know, to, uh, on, the, on the edge of Russia, uh, to uh, there's talk the Republicans want to do it, uh, of Ukraine and Georgia coming in on the borders of Russia. In 2008. Uh, first, in, right now in Poland Ukraine. already. Yeah. So what does that mean to, to be threatening first use? It means to be threatening to blow up. And we haven't gotten to this, but certainly Europe. Let's just talk about that at first. Europe gets annihilated. So it's been mad from the very beginning. Let me uh, add a little concrete detail to what Noam was quoting earlier about what I discovered when I asked, when I drafted the question, which was given by Kennedy, uh, in, his, in the name of Kennedy, by his actual assistant for national security, to the Joint Chiefs. And that was, if your plans, the existing plans, the Eisenhower plans in 61, are carried out as planned, get the targets you have in mind, how many people will die in the USSR and China? Now, I won't go into the reasons that are in the book why I narrowed it just to the USSR and China, but I did. It was actually in the belief that, amazingly enough, I thought, but I'd been told they didn't have an answer to that. Well, I was wrong. The people who told me that were wrong. Because they did have an answer, and they gave it without apology within days to the White House. And it was top secret. It's, it's on the second page of my book here. I think. Top secret, sensitive eyes only for the president. And I was seeing it because I'd written the question. So in the White House, I was shown their answer. And the answer was in the form of a chart with a, a simple linear model uh, of a rising line from the uh, vertical axis, a rising line on numbers of dead. Uh, the, it was rising over six months because uh, radioactive fallout would increase the deaths. and. I've often asked, uh, I can say, uh, audiences, when I've asked this, what do, you, what do you think they told the president? And I could do that tonight. The lights are in my eyes, actually. But I've asked, and, and very actually, just the other night, I got a, a, an unusually low answer, 100,000. I said, well, no, it's, it's higher than that. But rather, commonly, people will say 10 million, or 1 million, 10 million. It's, it's higher. And so on. The answer was, 325 million people if we struck first. So they had an answer. It clearly they had a model. And so I drafted the question in the White House office and sent it back down. 
okay, how many all together will be killed? And that came back quickly too, without without apology or embarrassment or anything else. And it was in the form of a table. And uh, I tell all this in the book, so you don't miss me, but to fill out because what he was saying. Another 100 million would be killed in the captive nations, the slave nations of East Europe, uh, Hungary, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, and so forth, East Germany, East Germany, including 100 million from their air defenses, attacks on those air bases, whatnot. They had to hit the air bases there. In theory, they didn't hit the cities in East Europe. But the air bases were all next to cities, and the air defenses were next to cities. So 100 million would be killed in addition to the 325 million in the USSR and China. And then another 100 million in contiguous areas to the Soviet Union and China, like neutrals, like Afghanistan, Austria, Finland, Japan, or not entirely neutral, India. So 100 million there from radioactive fallout. And without another warhead landing on West Europe, naturally, from our attack, a hundred million of our allies would be killed by radioactive fallout from East Europe and the Soviet Union, depending on which way the wind blew, supposedly, depending which depended on the season. But that added up then to 600 million or a hundred holocausts. So I thought, no, this is the most, as, as Noam has said, the answer is, how do you, there's no language. He's the linguist here. There's no language in human experience for before something like that. Winter was, before nuclear winter was understood. That's before, yes, before that's nuclear winter. Let me, let me come to that. But, you know, I, I, let me comment on, with you of all people, you know, on this question of language. Remember, this wasn't possible 75 years ago or in the millennia before that. You, you couldn't do that. I would, I would put to you, and I'll ask you, whether you know, we have language concepts that can really deal with it. Crime, murder, but genocide. Well, that fits. But genocide, wait a minute, this is a um, Omnicide. What? Omnicide. Was it's omnicide, as John Somerville yeah. said. But, well, it's strict omnicide later. At first, not omnicide. Yeah. Just one-third omnicide, because here's the way it came out. They weren't including fire, and they never have, That's because right. they said it's too hard to calculate. And you say that, that was deliberately excluded. Yeah, it deliberately, they because it, very well it would reduce the, the number of warheads you needed yeah. for the same yeah. effect. Okay, now, they weren't including fire, so as has been estimated since then by Lynn Eden, that would add at least another several hundred million. So you get up to a billion there. And moreover, not depending on which way the wind blew, Soviet Union would, with weapons we could not annihilate, or could not counter because there are too many of them, they're mobile, they're hidden, short-range weapons, medium-range weapons, they would annihilate West Europe for us anyway, 100 million, our allies. So it would be a billion out of then 3 billion population. So it would be one-third of what John Somerville called homicide, which is killing everybody. And however... What we didn't know for another 20 years, till 1983, 22 years later, when Sagan, Turco, Toon, several of TAP came up with the estimate of having looked at the question of, well, where there's fire, there's smoke. And how much smoke would, uh, would be generated? But what they really were looking at was not so much how much would be generated, but how much by nuclear weapons would be lofted into the stratosphere or it wouldn't rain out, like, for example, the Gulf War fires, when they put all the oil things on fire. That did not cause what I'm about to say, because it stayed low. It got rained, it not rained very much, but came down. Nuclear weapons loft the smoke by the 150 million tons, possibly, of toxic black soot from cities into... Uh, the stratosphere, where it doesn't rain out and where it quickly goes around the globe uh, within days and blocks some 70% of the sunlight, which gives you freezing temperatures every night, all year, and actually possibly much more than that, freezing all the lakes and rivers, 
and giving you conditions we haven't seen since the last ice age. But above all, killing all harvests. And it turns out in the last 10 years, 11 years since 2007, the studies have shown this lasts a decade or more. But a year is enough to starve nearly everyone. People, some people will probably live, uh, Alan Roebuck and Brian Toon tell me, in Australia eating fish and mollusks. But it turns out, to put it uh, this way, I just thought of it rather simply, if you're hitting 50 or 100 cities or more, and that plan hit every city in Russia, at the USSR, over 100,000, and 80% of the cities over 25,000, and every city in China. Well, if, well if that's hundreds and hundreds, you know, maybe 1,000 cities. If you hit something like 100 or 200, the biggest effect is going to be not the fire that they hadn't counted for, but the smoke from the cities, which was never listed among the effects of nuclear weapons. Why? You know, blast, prompt radiation, heat, kill people, uh, and radioactive fallout, they realized, from, especially from the H-bomb. Smoke? No. Nobody had figured it for another 20 years. Well, that was 35 years ago. People have now told me who are insiders on the plan, quite authoritatively, the plans have never reflected this, never taken into account any more than they take the fire into account, which means that our own attack, that our own attack would kill nearly everyone. And we've known this for 35 years. And the plans are still there. Now, if you thought of them as, well, they're just threats, you know, the gun, as if it weren't loaded, It'll never go off. You can rest easy. Uh, I told my wife, if I didn't know more than most people know about the accidents you were describing, the false alarms, how close we've come, I wouldn't worry either. But And I could think like other people, some other people. It's been 70 years. We haven't had a two-sided nuclear war since the one-sided one at Hiroshima. So we'll go another 70, another 700, whatever, you know, it's all right. I think it's been a miracle that we haven't had a two-sided nuclear war in that period. And it will be another miracle if we go another 70 years. And that doesn't mean it's impossible, it happened. But it means it's very unlikely. And we have, uh, we have gotten away with this so far. But as Noam is saying, it's taking a gamble that when you realize it, it's hard to describe in, in moral terms. You know, you just say immoral, evil, yes, uh, criminal. But these words don't seem, am I wrong? They don't seem quite adequate uh, here. We're, we're talking about something that just was not possible before, and most people are still unaware that it remains possible 35 years after the Cold War. And it's worth bearing in mind that in the face of all of this understanding, which is in fact shared by, uh, maybe not in detail, but in general terms with the a large part of the political class that's involved in decision making. In the face of all of this, we are now escalating the danger. So if you take a look at the latest nuclear posture review of the Trump administration a couple of weeks ago, it lowers the threshold for use of nuclear weapons and lowers it in a very dangerous way. It says we can use nuclear weapons in response to cyber attack. A cyber attack can be of all kinds and you don't know where it's coming from. Uh, you, you, it could be almost anywhere. So there could be some kind of a cyber attack, uh, maybe attacks uh, uh, an ele the electrical grid and we blow up the world. Okay, we destroy the world, including ourselves. Uh, it adds new nuclear weapons, uh, which are very dangerous, like uh, uh, submarine-launched tactical weapons. But as was immediately pointed out by the arms control specialists, uh, the country that's being threatened with those weapons doesn't know that they're low-yield weapons. They can't tell. All they know is the United States is 
enhancing the capacity for submarines to have uh, weapons that maybe are uh, not just warning weapons, but lethal destructive weapons. Uh, we're putting uh, uh, the, the, the simple fact of advancing uh, NATO to the Russian border, as George Kennan and others pointed out years ago, is virtually asking for disaster. I mean, if the Warsaw Pact were carrying out maneuvers on the Mexican border, we wouldn't tolerate it. Not in fact, it's unimaginable. But we're doing that in a way which sets up situations where uh, jet planes, jet fighters from the two sides are buzzing each other. What if they crash? Uh, uh, well, uh, all kinds of things could happen which could... It's, it's funny, you know, when you say that, I think of the fact... In Syria today, yeah. five of the nine nuclear powers, there's nine nuclear weapon states, five of them are engaging in conflict in Syria right now. U.S., Russia, Britain, France, and Israel. Okay? In the airspace. And, and in, in fact, cruisers. if you look at, take Syria, the latest uh, missile attack uh, after the alleged chemical warfare uh, use, alleged, remember, nobody s still knows for sure what it was, was apparently mostly symbolic. My guess is it was probably coordinated with the Russians because it seemed to have been designed to avoid uh, any uh, anything beyond symbolic significance. In fact, they may have hit a medical research facility and destroyed it. It's not quite known. But it had consequences. One of the consequences was that Russia threatened, I don't know if they're going to do it, but they threatened to uh, uh, stop, uh, install advanced anti-aircraft and anti-missile systems in Syria. Israel's not going to tolerate that. If they come in Israel, they announced right away, and we'll do it. We'll do whatever they can to destroy them. At that point, they get into confrontation with Russians. What goes on then? What happens at that point? I mean, these are playing with fire, point after point, where in fact diplomatic options are available. In North Korea, dip diplomatic options have been available for years. In Iran, uh, there has been a diplomatic success, which is now being probably in a couple of weeks blown up. And there are many other diplomatic options which have simply not even been explored because the U.S. won't allow it. Overall, the, uh, and, and the de-emphasis on diplomacy is now becoming kind of pathological, like the State Department's have practically been eliminated. The diplomatic services don't function, just uh, wave a bigger and bigger weapon, knowing very well uh, what the consequences might be of even an accidental uh, 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 event of the kind that has happened hundreds of times in the last in the past years. If this is not uh, institutional madness, as you call it, it's hard to imagine what. Now, how happened. do you how do you understand, Noam? That you know, we're uh, how do you understand that it it has come to this? It's come to this. In other words, why? How can you understand at this point in your life? Well, I think. Uh, Part of the answer is given by a, a, sm a sm kind of casual mention in your book when you talk about Los Alamos before the uh, uh, the uh, nuclear weapons bombing. Uh, uh, Los Alamos uh, was the place where they were putting uh, the, the the atom bomb had two phases. Uh, one was the Chicago project where they were basically making the ammunition. Uh, the other was the Los Alamos project, where they were making the gun that you used to fire it. So the Manhattan, the uh, Ch Manhattan project, the Chicago part was finished earlier. Uh, the Los Alamos uh, component wasn't finished until the gun went off, until the actual bombing. It was known at that time that the Germans were not making a bomb. They were out of it. In fact, at the end, the Germans were, were had already been uh, been, been uh, 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 occupied, conquered, and occupied. Though Germans, 
Los Alamos, the people at Los Alamos were the a collection of the most brilliant, humane, cultivated, educated people that you could gather in the whole world. If you tried to make a collection of such people, it's approximately what you had at Los Alamos. Turns out that there was no discussion at Los Alamos about what they were doing, even after it was known that the Germans were out of the war. Uh, they were focused entirely on the technical, the exciting technical problem of seeing if this would work. Now, there's something about us which allows us to get involved in solving interesting technical problems within a framework in which we never ask the question, what's next, what's outside it? And I think we're probably all familiar with this in one, at one level or another, but here is a case where it's just a spectacular example of how uh, the most remarkable uh, group of people you can imagine bringing together and isolating were subordinated to the technical problem of seeing if this gun would work and not asking what they were doing. In fact, uh, there were uh, questions, serious questions raised, like by Leo Gillard, which you comment on, but they were raised from Chicago after their phase of the uh, enterprise was over. These are very interesting things to contemplate, to ask ourselves, what is it about our, our culture, our, uh, uh, our picture of the world, our understanding that allows us to function in this fashion. You know, a, a very, okay, a good, a good response. Uh, I wanna, and I think there's a lot there. I would take issue with one word you used. These men were brilliant intellectuals, scientific. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. The word, okay, I think of my friend and mentor here as, uh, in a class by yourself, you know, himself. Uh, the word genius is something that I apply to people like these people at Los Alamos, generally hard sciences or artists, musicians, artists, or sorts of, and really I only, only one person in the social sciences that I know, I've never said this to you, but I've said it to other people, that uh, that's a word that I use for you. I think in, a, in social sciences, it's a, in a class by yourself, but, and now here's something that came to me this afternoon. The word, I, they were brilliant uh, among hard scientists, among mathematicians, among physicists and all the, they were at the top. But you said humane, not particularly. As individuals, uh, I think they were. Well, you could, you, all mean, right, that's your, it's not yeah. the way I would use the word particularly because let me, let me make a point that uh, for a, quite a while, I've had a linguistic or a semantic issue with people who talk, who use the word inhuman as a synonym for inhumane. And they use human as a synonym for humane. And I think that's a mistake. It's a misconception. It's a, it's a wrong self-image that we have, generally have, that to be more human is to be more decent, concerned, caring, compassionate, truthful, all these things? Actually not, uh, I would say. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a joke, it's, it, it may do us in uh, very well, as you know. And I'll tell you something I had this afternoon from, from, your, uh, from our discussion together, which I loved. Uh, we had a, several hours which are always marvelous for me with my ears to Noam's lips here. Uh, uh, so a very good discussion. I'll tell you something that I had afterwards uh, thought of. I've been having a discussion with another friend of mine who's very much in favor of evidence-based thinking as opposed to just feeling and just emotion, you know, and so forth, ideology, authority, and whatnot. No, reason, rationality. I think of myself in recent years as having belonged very long to a religion of reason, of rationality, the Vatican was Rand Corporation, actually, with decision theory and rational. My, my honors thesis at Harvard was 
theories of rational choice under uncertainty. And I've come, as I get older, and I mean, we can talk tomorrow about this, but you know what we've all learned since we were 15, whatnot. What, what I've learned, I've, I've learned to be much more skeptical of uh, the degree to which we're protected by rationality and reason, because that is so often, so often in the service of mistaken, terrible premises, or just terrible desires, you know, and less. Uh, it can be uh, the people I was with in the office of Secretary of Defense and others were, at RAND were very, very bright, but we were working on problems that were making the world more dangerous while thinking we were doing the opposite. And uh, that's, that's not uncommon. It's very common. And now, okay, I'll tell you what I thought of this afternoon. No, it really wasn't. Okay, no one more capable of intellectual analysis than you. And so, really, over the years, our information has mainly been a one-way flow from, uh, from Noam to me, except on a few subjects where I had personal experience, uh, as in this book. And it struck me, now, I happen to have been having this argument with somebody about reason and rationality and the idea of evidence. Look, uh, the people who uh, had evidence uh, of WMDs in Iraq, you know, weapons of mass destruction, there was evidence, actually. Uh, and I think they actually believed what they were saying, that there were WMDs. There weren't any. But, of course, that was very familiar to me because the Tonkin Gulf had been an example of a war started on a false alarm, which I happen to know. No one could know from outside. But I think the people inside McNamara and LBJ, like myself, believed on August 4th, 1964, which was my first day in the Pentagon, that there had been an attack. There was evidence for it. It was not that there was no evidence. It was a question of what do you believe and what do you want to believe? Exactly. And what they said was, by the way, was there was unequivocal evidence as of the WMDs many years later. Well, that was a flat lie. Uh, we knew it was, it was equivocal. It was ambiguous. There was contradictory evidence. But they believed it for a day or so until more and more evidence was accumulating and so forth. And that is an example, actually, where we started the bombing on what was effectively a false alarm. And WMDs to the extent that they really cared about those, I think there was a belief by Cheney and the others that there must be WMDs there. Uh, but they uh, cooked the books. Well, there what must, the weapons of mass There must be because we wanted We wanted to them. Attack. They had to right. be there to justify what we were doing. Yeah. So it was not that there was no reason and no analysis, uh, but it was um, uh, based on the selective evidence, you know, Okay. But that's very much like the estimates of Russian military force. Oh, exactly. We want to believe it. Okay, so well, so wait, this is a perfect example, if I may say. Uh, you, you mentioned it, but without giving actual figures. Let me give you the figure, which, by the way, you mentioned that I revealed this. Yeah. Actually not. I revealed it to the Rand Corporation. Yeah. But in the Pentagon, I and mean, in intelligence, you know, yeah. I was reading the estimates, yeah. of course. I didn't come to them. But here, <laughs> I'll make it brief uh, as I can. It's uh, in great detail in the book. But the estimates, I, I was working on the idea of a missile gap at RAND uh, that the Russians had, as everybody, all my colleagues believe, uh, very much uh, superiority of Russian missiles. And they were the first to test an ICBM. Ours came considerably later, so ours kept collapsing and whatnot. So they were ahead of us there. They put a satellite up there which showed that they could, you know, it was accurate enough for an ICBM and so forth. So there was, there was reason to believe they were ahead of us. But then the estimates became that, uh, how much ahead of us? Well, we had 40 Atlas and Titan ICBMs in 1961, and about 120 Polaris sub-launch missiles in range of Russia. We had a lot more than that in the way of planes. The estimate was that they had at least 160, some said 120, but the Strategic Air Command in August of 1961, when I went out there to discuss the my draft of the plan, I was informed that the head, Tommy Powers, of Strategic Air Command was sure there were a thousand Russian ICBMs. This was in August 1961. Well, that was much higher than the Air Force estimate even, which was like 160. It was very much higher, but a thousand. He believed and he was telling that to the president. A month later, the Discover satellite, so the Corona system, code name, 
just had full coverage of their sites for the first time. There'd been cloud cover before, they'd been flying them for about a year, but they didn't have full coverage. They finally had full coverage, and what they turned out the Russians had were four ICBMs. Not 160, and not 1,000, but four. We had 10 times as many. You know, I don't know if you've noticed, I, I, I think I mentioned in the book, that Richard Rhodes, who's the best, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning, and deservedly so, uh, historian of the A-bomb and then the H-bomb and others, 30 or 40 years later, he was saying what we'd said at the time, that the Russians had about 40. Well, that's about as many as we had uh, ICBMs. That's 10 times more than they had, actually, which meant they had essentially nothing. But and it as had you already say, been made public. What? It had already been made public that they only had four. Well, they had 192 bombers that could reach the United States. Yeah. We had something like 3,000 bombers within range of uh, Russia. And by the way, in this year, as you mentioned, something that struck you in the book uh, was, I, I said, you know, 600 million altogether, maybe a billion. Over 100 million of those were Chinese. Every city in China was to be hit in the event of a conflict over Berlin. And actually, uh, General Shoup, who was uh, the commandant of the Marine Corps, and actually had been Interesting. He had been the uh, speaker at my graduation from basic school, it mm -hmm. so happened, uh, in the Marine he Corps. He was the Marine Corps Commandant. He was the Marine Corps Commandant. Yeah. And uh, he, was, he had the Medal of Honor, by the way, uh, because he had conducted the attack on Tarawa yeah. from the beach under a live Japanese bunker where they had snipers to keep him from being shot while he was directing the an attack on the beach. Anyway, very brave guy. Later, very much against the Vietnam War, by the way. Okay, so Shroop is the one person who raises a question about this plan. And they were all describing it, the Joint Chiefs, as a very good plan. Wonderful. This is the Eisenhower plan that I was modifying, which killed over 100 million Chinese. And so Shroop is the one person who said, this is not a good plan. Any plan that kills 100 million Chinese when they have not been part of the fight is not a good plan. That is not the American way. But it was the American plan, and it remained so, and it remained so for years thereafter. What, so, was, the reaction, what was the reaction to Shoup's comment? But nothing. You know, it just went on. Actually, uh, uh, the guy who describes this, who was present, said things went on. You know, it was just ignored essentially. Okay, look, I'll tell you something I learned in the course of the book. Uh, of writing, uh, No, after I'd written the bulk of the book. How are we doing? We, we actually are, are running out of time, so I was going to suggest that you say whatever, you know, we haven't said. I know we could go on for, for hours, <laughs> and I was hoping for, you know, at least um, a little sliver of Light or hope? <laughs> um, so you, I, you can I was love reading one. the transcript. I read all the old <laughs> interviews and all. And in one case, somebody at the end of the thing said, uh, Professor Chomsky, do you know any jokes? <laughs> <laughs> he said, all I know are some Jewish jokes. <laughs> he didn't give any. He gave me one this afternoon when I reminded him of it. Well, I mean, you've both um, d dedicated your lives in different ways to activism. And I wonder, I mean, it does seem like today the, the anti-war left is much more focused on on various other threats, on, you know, the destruction of Yemen and, and, all, and all of the sort of warmongering of this administration. But what, so attention is not focused on what we've been discussing tonight on nuclear pro proliferation. So how, I mean, you, you're both contributing to that, that raising of consciousness that's so necessary, but what can citizens do? I think we can do a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, if people understand these things and also understand something we really haven't gotten to, that in every single one of these crisis situations, there are feasible, solution, peaceful solutions. If you go through, if we had time, you go through them one after the other, North Korea, Iran, Russian border, 
uh, New START treaty, you know, cutting back nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, every one of these cases, there are very clear, in fact, I might say, at some level, well known. That means the evidence is available. It means to approach the situations uh, from the point of view of not threatening greater destruction, but pursuing diplomatic options. They do exist in every case, and with enough citizen dedication, activism, and pressure, I think governments can be compelled to pursue those options. All right, well, I think that is a great note to end on. Thank you. I'd like to thank the university, the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, Professor Chomsky, Dan Ellsberg. It's been a real wonder to hear from you tonight. So thank you, and thank you for, for coming out, everyone, tonight. You should tell them about our first huh? meeting in October 67 when you were watching me from the windows of the Pentagon.